Hello and welcome to the Gallagher Premiership. Uh, hello and welcome to the Gallagher Premiership Rugby. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> you said it. Hello and welcome to Gallagher Premiership Rugby's The Lowdown. Uh, we're incredibly casual this week. We've got coffees. Flat white is yours, flat white? Mocha. Mocha, well done. Um, Craig Doyle bought these with his own money and he's asked us to have them on camera. He's in a nearby studio and he's asked us to have them on here so that everyone knows he bought them. It's difficult. It's like this is an ad, like a hashtag ad for Craig Doyle's generosity. <laughs> I still think he got them for nothing. I still don't believe he would have paid he for them. Pay for anything. No. no, I've never seen him pay for anything. Amazing. Um, all of his clothes are free, his underwear is free. Anyway, we're here to talk about rugby. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about, Tops, is the cancelled game on Friday night. Gloucester rugby against Worcester Warriors cancelled. I think it was five hours before kickoff, which is late, late, late doors. It's one of those ones where you know, COVID almost gives people a get out now. It's like, I, I still use it for dinner parties and stuff I don't want to go to. I think I've got it, might have it, don't want to go. But it kind of gives you an out. But that reduced squad numbers is what we're told. And then a, a front row have failed, a specialist front row have failed his fitness test on the day, so couldn't play it. Um, but it still feels late, because it still feels like, couldn't you have registered some other players because you knew this guy had a tweak, had a knock, whatever it is. Like Cardiff proved a couple of weeks ago in Europe that actually you can still find players to go and play. So what do you think of it all? Yeah, you've just given your trade secret away there, by the way. You know, if he never misses an appointment, you now know why. Yeah, that's um, it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, this, is, this is an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, yes, COVID is still in the background. You know, it's still having an impact. Um, but this one's slightly different in terms of the timing as well. You think fans are on their way. They're getting ready for a big game Friday night and you get the news breaking that the game's off. And when front row is concerned, you would always have a contingency. That's why you have your traveling reserves. That's why you have extra cover. You can have as much cover as you want, really, in anticipation of if a player fails, who else have we got? And yes, I know they've lost some players from COVID as well. My gut says that there's you know, a story grumbling with this. Um, on face value, we have to trust what Worcester have told us, but you'd like to think that that game maybe could have gone ahead if they really wanted it to go ahead. So I think that's what we need to figure out. Um, interesting one. There's lots of retired props around that would have done an Andy Goode and come out of retirement for a large check. I mean, I'm not, you know, no one in particular, but there are guys that might have done it. Um, next thing I want to talk about is returning superstars. So the whole the sort of season structure is a way bigger conversation for us to have another time. But of course, a lot of these clubs lose well, ultimately their best players to international duty and of course injury, that just happens. But they're starting to flood back. Was in particular like a team that have just got a load of top players back at the same time and suddenly they're winning, suddenly they're playing better. Um, but how have you seen the returning stars perform this weekend in round 20? Yeah, it's been a big weekend, big impact as well. And, and I think we're going to see that. You almost come out of the Six Nations and now it's like, right, where are we in the league? What do we need to do to get what our, what our goals are, what we want to achieve? And you look at the stars returning. I mean, Was were probably the standout example of. You look at where they were probably December time, 18, 19 players out injured, and you now look at them, you know, you've got Robson, Launchbury, Fekitoa, Odogwu, these guys all back, Barbary as well. You get that many players back, it's going to have an impact on your team, you know, and other teams can test testify to that as well. So Courtney Laws for Saints. Courtney Laws so getting sharp. him back as well, Lewis Ludlam back this weekend yeah. as well. You can see the impact these guys have, and they'll be looking for a big sprint finish because, you know, nothing is decided. You'd say, okay, Leicester, Sarries, possibly Quinns, looking good for the playoffs. There's a big chasing pack and the teams at the bottom, they're still, you know, they could qualify for Europe. There's still that carrot as well. So loads to play for in quite a short window. So I actually think the standard of rugby left this season, it's going to go through the roof. So it's going to be great for us to watch. Yeah, it is. And the sun's out. Hopefully it stays out. Nice. I mean, I hated playing in, in the heat, but I love watching other people suffer <laughs> anaerobically um, because the ball's dry, isn't it? Um, Another thing, post Six Nations tops, just want to cover off what one of the main narratives in the English game post Six Nations has been whether or not Eddie Jones should remain in his post after two. There's no escaping it. The last two Six Nations finishes performances have been poor overall, not enough wins, not enough tries and all that. So performance targets, whatever they were, they haven't been hit. There's just no way they've been hit because England never aimed to finish, you know, in the sort of bottom half of the Six Nations. They haven't been hit. What do you think about Eddie Jones remaining in post? Uh, and do you think it's, I mean, South Africa changed head coaches, right? They brought in Rassi Rasmus at this point and won the thing, but he felt like the natural successor to a regime, to a, to a, a team and a, and a squad that was failing to a far larger extent than England. They frankly looked in a way worse place than England do now. And I, I'm asking you the question, but I'm also giving you my opinion. But yeah, it's kind of like you, that. But, you need, but you, you need an automatic replacement, right? And I, I feel like the automatic replacement for me is Steve Borthwick, but he's got a job. 
And actually, he's, you know, he's, Leicester might not want to let him go. He might not want to leave Leicester. It's not as simple as all that. So it's, it, it, what we want to do as pundits is take a strong editorial line and stick with it. But I feel like, well, it's easy to say get rid of him. But it's like when you know, I said on telly once, I, you know, I said, well, he's got to play for England. And one of the other lads said to me, well, who'd you drop? I said, that's a good point, actually. Can't we just have 16 players? You know, someone else got to come in, right? So what's your view Yeah, on that? that's it. I mean, I, I'm with you. Like, so first and foremost, I think he stays. You know, it's very easy to say, right, we need to get rid of him. But the big question would be who comes in at this point in time in the season? You think of maybe the coaches, you know, Borthwick, maybe a Baxter who might be on that short list. They're not leaving now to go for England. You know, they've got prizes in front of them. They've got the league. They've got Europe, things they want to go on and achieve. They're not going anywhere. But for me, I think Eddie stays. I think what England need at this moment in time is consistency. They need to, yes, they had a disappointing Six Nations, that's fine. But they need to build on what they've done through this last eight mm. weeks, keep this squad together, give them the experience. They're probably a year behind. They probably could have done this a year ago to be in a better position now. You look at France and Ireland, that consistency in their squad, massive factor, made a huge yep. difference for them. So England, stay as they are learn from the experiences, be better, go to Australia, put in a strong performance, and we'll see, we'll see what happens from there. But, you know, for anyone who's still got a bit of a Six Nations hangover, the Red Roses are on TV, TVBB? TVBB, TV, 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 whatever you want. That's yeah. a word. They're on CBB. They are back yeah. on TV. Yep. Big start for them. So there you go. They'll cheer you up. They'll cheer you and I, up. And I, looking ahead to the World Cup with regards to England, I think what Rassi Rasmus did so well with the box was, you know, absolutely, what is our DNA? What is our identity? That is how we're playing. And people think they're just a route one team. 95% of Route 1 aggressive confrontational team full of power with a little bit of speed and genius dotted around the place and some decent, a decent goal kicker on the roster. And that is how they play. And they've, they're the best team in the world, right? So all this talk of France being the best team in the world. They ain't the best team. They're the second best team in the world. South Africa know exactly what they're about. And you and I watch a lot of rugby. We watch all these games every week. It's not a bad job, but it is a job. We watch them all. And I, I look at England and I think I couldn't quite tell you how they're trying to play. And... When I hear Eddie Jones say, well, this is our, this is exactly how we want to play, this is how we think we're going to go and win the World Cup, I look at it, it's the team that knows what they're about the best that is likely to win the World Cup and gets lucky with injuries and all that. But free-flowing rugby, sort of Harlem Globetrotter stuff, no numbers on backs. I hope I'm wrong, but I hear that and I think that ain't going to win you a World Cup against the box or the All Blacks. What you need is a great kicking game, brilliant kick chase and relentless defence. I mean, am I being really boring here? No, but you are on the money, bang on the money with all of that. You need to have a clear identity with how you're going to play the game. I mean, I look like I look at Ireland a lot. I know you know, France were the winners, grand slammers, but I look at Ireland. I look at mm. the start of Andy Farrell's tenure and it was tricky. Yep. They'll say it, they'll admit it. It was tricky getting the players to buy in, getting them to understand what he wanted to do, how he's going to take it away from Joe Schmidt. Now they have it, and it is very clear in how they play. You look at the structure that leads into the unstructured stuff. So they're very, very organised, very, very drilled. But what they've developed now over time is their ability, with the skills as well, Mike Katz done a lot of work on their handling, forwards, backs, their ability to just decide once they get to the line what's happening, where mm. are the options, and to do that. And that comes with time. Comes yeah. with time, comes with continuity. Comes clarity with a bit of, of message as clarity well. Clarity of message, yeah. so that, that consistency of coaches. Probably going through a bit of pain as well, which England mm. are at the minute, but you stick with it. I mean, like we say, yes, South Africa went somewhere different and it worked for them. But I think for England, consistency, especially when you don't get as much access to the players, consistency is key. Yeah, on that, really interesting. I heard, I think it was Eddie Jones that said it. It's a brilliant point, really clever point. And obvious when you think about it is that people talk about Ireland peaking between World Cups. But actually, most of that Ireland team is Leinster. Right, and if it's not Leinster, it's likely to be Munster. So these guys play together every day, an awful lot year round. So they are naturally going to be more cohesive. You'd imagine the relationships are better, naturally more cohesive than an England team. I know England have got a bigger pool of players and all that sort of stuff, but the lads that have way less time together. So these guys, when they're not together, are still together, if you see what I mean. So, but then you get this extended period of a couple of months or a few months before a World Cup. And I think it was Eddie Jones. If I'm misquoting you, Eddie, sorry about that. But someone told me you said it, or I read it somewhere, whatever it was. But actually, that catches other teams up in terms of cohesion because you get all that yeah, all that time that. together. And then that advantage that was Ireland's is no longer Ireland's. Everybody has that enhanced community. So, really, yeah, really interesting. And maybe it's just me that thinks that's interesting. Maybe it's just you and me. Maybe, not sure. Maybe anyway, uh, lovely stuff, Tops. <laughs> uh, right, we've um, we've enlisted some help again from the Bournemouth Under 11s this time to help us with a bit of the show. Tell you what's coming up, a bit of the show that we're not very good at. They're better at it. Hi, we are from Bournemouth Rugby Under 11s team. And coming up on this week's show are all the highlights from Round 21. 
On Saturday, Bath played Shell Sharks. London Irish took on Northampton. Saracens played Bristol Bears and Wolves played Newcastle Falcons. On Sunday, Exeter played Leicester Tigers. Highlights of all those games coming up. Enjoy the show! Long way to go here for Bristol. Foa, nice handling from Thomas to Randrandra. Harding to Piertown, maybe it is on. Tearing upfield now, Joyce trying to straighten. Oh, just goes straight through. Delivers the killer pass. Oh, Jack Bates has stolen this game for the Bristol Bears. The officials want to check it out. Yeah, they've got to check it out, they've got to. Forward. Oh, the hands, the hands are forward. Do you know what? Up to that point, he does so, so well. And do you know what? I, I feel so sorry for Joe Joyce. Saracens then, as they so often do, finding a way to win on the big day. But we're going to start topsy at the end of that game. And I don't care who you support, unless it's Saracens, obviously. You don't want to see that happen to anyone, let alone Joe Joyce, do you? Oh, man, so gutted for him. So gutted. Mm. I mean, it was a brilliant piece of play start to finish. Bristol chasing the win. They looked like they were in trouble. That Saracens defence was putting them under pressure. And then they produce some magic. They get down that wide channel. Joe Joyce streaking away, does everything right. And then you think, this is it. Try scoring pass. It looked forward. It definitely was forward. And Saracens get over the line. But yeah, like you say, Gutted for Joe Joyce. Yeah, gutted. We're going to get to Sarri's in a sec, but first of all, Antoine Frisch in the midfield, the Frenchman playing for Bristol Bears, he looks sharp, didn't he? Yeah, brilliant. Like you say, you know, Randrandra on the bench, Frisch steps up, and he played really, really well, was threatening, was dangerous, and was a lot of the reason why Bristol, like I said, we said probably should have won the game, but why they were so competitive in that game for so long. He's been a really class addition. Yeah, it's something that might have given Bristol an advantage during the game would have been if Saracens had got a couple of yellow cards, which they didn't. Owen Farrell, shoulder charge, Billy Vunapola, one-handed knock-on and all that. What do you think of those? They weren't given. What do you think of those? Do you think they should have been yellows? They weren't given, but for me, very easy one. I think they were both yellows. You know, I think those are incidences that you can probably avoid. And I think they would have had a massive impact on the game, but you know, they weren't given and credit to Saracens in their fashion. You know, you looked at the team to begin with and thought, right, internationals are back, Owen Farrell is back, and they're fully stacked. And that probably told in the end. I mean, Farrell just went about his business as he always does. I thought Max Malins on the wing was exceptional. Elliot Daly, very, very good too. And, you know, even in times when they're in trouble, you know, Marrow comes up with that brilliant turnover as well. So they just win those moments in the game that just keeps things ticking over. And they, OK, maybe a bit of luck at the end with the forward pass, but they did enough to get over the line. And they are a top team. And as Martin Johnson so rightly said recently, good players play well. That's a really good point. Their, their top players That's do it. seem to stand nice up and, and arrive, don't they? They play well. Big games, big occasion. Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, Jamie George 250, Ezekwe 100. Yep. They stepped up and they got the job done. And it was London Irish's party, Paddy's Day party here at the Brentford Community Stadium. A bumper crowd, nearly 15,000 here today. But they have seen the home time hammered by Northampton Saints. So on last week's take, we had a look at players who are going to influence their teams pushing for the playoffs. And this week is no different. We are looking at Northampton Saints, Rory Hutchison. Now, a lot of the stuff might look basic, might look simple, but good players make it look that way. And here he is. So in the 12 shirt as a second ball player, the ability to scan, to see space and to execute the pass. He knows he sees Irish are down numbers. He needs the ball out the back. He executes a great pass. This is off a line break, again as first receiver. All you're going to see is ball into two hands, into one hand, back into two. When there's space, you take it. Yes, he shouldn't break those tackles, but he does because he's a very balanced runner and he gets the ball down as well. Look at this, OK, he's showing, gets the fence out, back into two hands. That trickery as well, it just means you keep defenders guessing. This is my favourite bit, OK? When you're under pressure as a 12, the ability to see what the defence is doing and make the right decisions, that pass on the line to Dingwall, that bigger Hutchison-Dingwall combination is lethal at the minute, and that is a lovely bit of play. I think they could have gone out the back as well, but they hit the front option and they steamroll under the post. Brilliant performance from him. Saints may be looking out of the picture, but maybe if they keep going on the way they are, they might just have a sniff of the playoffs. And I know it was a tough day for the Irish, but Flat, you thought it was a good day for the Northampton Saints. It was, and it was a good game to commentate on because you got to scream a lot with lots of tries. But 
Northampton Saints were fantastic, but first, Irish. It's just agony for them. Yes, the players and the coaches, but what you can't see on the TV is around the stadium. That is a massive event for St. Patrick's Day. Massive amount of work and organisation gone into it, and they did get hammered, didn't they? So it wasn't a good day for Irish. No, it was tough. and especially They had the perfect start. Scored a try, mm. had a penalty, and things were looking good 10 minutes in. But then Saints took control. The Ratu Nurara break was key as well, just in giving Saints momentum. I think for Irish, just too many errors, coupled with ill discipline as well. Two yellow cards, you can't really afford that when you're playing in this league. And yeah, I, I put it as an off day, hopefully. Like I say, off the pitch, brilliant, loads going on, great atmosphere, great attendance. Stadium was rocking, but just didn't get it right on the pitch. And Northampton Saints, I watched that game at the weekend and thought, this team today could be anybody. They looked absolutely fantastic. The second row, Ratuni, Arara and Ribbon. The back row, Courtney Laws back from England duty, super sharp, beautiful hands at the line. Lewis Ludden, first game in six weeks. The midfield, Alex Mitchell, the back three. I mean, all of them. They looked brilliant, didn't they? They looked like they could go and win the thing. I mean, is that such a crazy thing to say? Uh, it's not. I mean, they're in the position whereby if they go on a bit of a run, they put themselves in the mix. I see you had to mention Dave Ribbon there, one of your favourites. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't have favourites, Top seat. I mean, I do. They're all called Dave. Ribbons <laughs> and Ewers. They're the only two. But I do like him. I think he should have more England caps than he's got, but I think that about a lot of players are not picking the England team. The Saints look razor sharp. Their running isn't that easy, is it? They've got to play Quinns, they've got to play Saris, they've got to play Bristol at home. Any chance of a top well, four? Well, if think? they play like they did on Saturday, they've definitely got a chance. They play some brilliant rugby, some great attacking rugby. Their counter-attack as well, in particular when they turned over the ball, lethal. So why not? This is the season to have a crack. He's missed it by the near post. The final whistle sounded and Faf de Klerk down on the ground, distraught, but it is a share of the points and he's cramped up at the same time as well, 24 points apiece it is finished. So a game you could very easily say the visitors sell sharks should have won and perhaps they should if Faf de Klerk had kicked that, I wouldn't want to take the kick, the kick myself personally, but Topsy, a draw very rarely feels right, but did this feel right? You know, on the whole, I'd say yes. I mean, both teams will disagree. You know, you see that last kick and think, right, Sale could have won it. But over the course of the game, the balance shifted to both teams. You know, Bath started really well, playing some really nice rugby, Cipriani controlling things really well. And they look ahead and they look really good. But then Sale come back, the power game comes to the fore again. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they take control of the game and have a shot to, to win it at the end. And that's what happens in these tight games. They go back and forth, back and forth. And then you think, right, which team is going to come out on top? A draw, probably the fair result overall. I love the way uh, Faf de Klerk, I don't love the way he missed it, but he missed the kick and then he's down on his haunches and he looks distraught and you realise yeah. he's actually got a cramp in his calves yeah, and he's up and grinning <laughs> two seconds. He's absolutely fine, uh, a positive mental attitude. But Bath Topsy, talk about them briefly. For so much of this season so far, they've effectively been the Gallagher Premiership's whipping boys. They've been getting well beaten home and away quite often. That appears to be changing. What's changed? I know Cipriani's back. Quite an understated you know, performance, running the game really nicely. His work on the outside for De Glanville's try, still got a bit of toe, played really nicely. Is, is he the difference? Is Underhill the difference? What is it? Because things appear to be changing. Yeah, I'd say it's all of them collectively. You know, you, you probably can't single out anyone, but those guys, those senior players, they're internationals, have come back, have picked up form, and it's having an impact on the younger players who are kind of holding the fort. You know, while these guys were away and they were injured, think of your Ajomos, you know, think of your Baileys, think of your De Glanvilles. You know, these guys were having to learn it the hard way. Now they've got their season's internationals around them. Everybody's on form. They've maybe bought in collectively to what they're trying to do ahead of a big finish to the end of the season where things were so bad. And it's looking a lot better. You know, they're picking up wins now, they're picking up draws, but they're in a much better place. And, you know, they're looking ahead to maybe next season as well, new head coach coming in. So there's loads to play for. And... Great stadium, great city. Why wouldn't you want to put on a performance like that mm. for your fans? Well, he couldn't keep his feet, but he had no problem keeping his line. Jimmy Gotham has sent wasps in front. Jimmy Gopeth, what about Jimmy Gopeth still doing it? Topsy, how old are you? 36, 36. You, you look great. Can you imagine three years from now, three years from now, still playing in the Gallagher Premiership and still winning your team games in the dying seconds, in those clutch moments? Can you imagine doing that? I can imagine it, but whether it would actually happen, <laughs> yeah. no, my hamstrings wouldn't let me. I mean, that's an amazing clutch kick. I will say, I don't think it was a penalty. I think that's a harsh decision against Newcastle, but if you give it an opportunity to step up and win the game for your team, 
That's what you do. Yeah, agree entirely. And Wasp actually did very well to win it. I mean, yeah, the penalty, we've had a good look at that, and we think that's a bit of a dodgy one, don't we? But they did well to win it because Newcastle properly brought it, didn't they? Not the most glamorous hat trick you'll ever see from George McGuigan, but they did bring it, Newcastle. Yeah, they did, absolutely. You know, they came to play and you know, came with some real intent. But talking about how teams have improved through the season, Wasp, a very good example of that getting players back, getting their international back, Robson, Launchbury, getting Willis back fit and rampaging, carrying, not just Jackling, carrying really effectively as well. You add in Odogwu as well. So they've got the weapons, the Arsenal, Fekitoa again, another one. All these internationals coming back into a team is going to have a massive effect. And I mean, you did just touch on him as well, though. McGuigan, outstanding for Newcastle in defeat once again. Yeah, yeah, what a player. And I, I feel like it, it's the sort of thing that lots of people hate, people like you and me saying, you're not saying it, I am. I genuinely think if he played for a different club and if he had done for the last five years, he would have a whole big, he'd have a whole load of England caps. I think he is a brilliant rugby player and it took England years to realise how good someone like Mark Wilson was. Will they ever realise how good George McGuigan is? I think they might not and I think it's such a shame. I think he's a wonderful player um, and his hat-trick, it's one of the worst hat-tricks I've ever seen. It could only have been worse if it was three driving malls. It still counts. Uh, yeah, two of them were, but yeah, a, a wonderful player. Simmons. Slade is caught. And he's grounding the ball. Carried back over the line. And that is it. The Tigers digging in for all their worth defensively and coming out on top. Their first win here in seven and a half years. Into the playoffs for Leicester. Exeter's battle goes on with their losing bonus. Full-time, Exeter 17, Leicester 22. Right, let's have a quick look at the Gallagher Premiership table and it's as you were in the top four with Leicester, Saracens, Quinns and Chiefs. A bit of movement in the middle of the pack with Sales Sharks and Northampton Saints making their way up the table and at the bottom, still Bath bringing up the rear but they're in good company. And let's have a look at what's coming up next week in round 22. The action kicks off on Friday night with Sale against Saracens. Four fixtures on Saturday. It's Exeter against Bath, Gloucester against Wasps, Northampton Saints against Bristol and Worcester against Newcastle. And rounding up the action on Sunday, it is London Irish against Harlequins. Those games at Sale, Northampton and Irish on BT Sport. The rest are on PRTV Live. And don't forget you can catch all the highlights on ITV. Right, that's all the Gallagher Premiership action done, but it's time for your grassroots buttes. Big local derby, Furwood Waterloo against Sefton. Let's have it. Hayley Willis, the teacher, Tony McCartney to Hannah Roberts. You can see her dad, John, running touch. Stalwart Nessa Temple finds Jess Kavanagh. Debut for the Welsh speedster on loan from Sale. Where's she going? Needs support. Finds Emma Hutchinson. Captain Rachel Thomas bearing down on a 200th game for the club. Slips but gets the kick through. Another debutant, Karis Jones, working hard. Hutchinson up in support, the fire officer, linking with Freya Helen and Waterloo score a peach in the derby. Helen with a try to grace their special 30th anniversary kit. Right, that's it for the lowdown this week. Have you had a nice time? Yeah, I loved it, mate. It's been really good. Me too. We're both, we're both absolutely buzzing. See you next week.